The impact of that World Cup victory was enormous, both broadening the game's grassroots and as well as connecting all Sri Lankans with one shared passion. For the first time, children from outstations and government schools were allowed to make cricket their own. Cricket was opened up to the masses. This unlocked the door for untapped talent not in, only to gain exposure, but have a realistic chance of playing the game at the highest level. These new grassroots cricketers brought with them the attributes of normal Sri Lankans, playing the game with a passion, a joy and intensity that had been hitherto missing. They had watched Sanaf, Kalu, Murali and Aravinda play a brand of cricket that not only changed the concept of one day cricket, but was also instantly identifiable as being truly Sri Lankan. We were no longer timid or soft or minnows. We had played and beaten the best in the world. We had done that without pretense or shame, in a manner that highlighted and celebrated our national values, our collective cultures, and our habits. It was a brand of cricket we were proud to call our own, a style with local spirit and flair embodying all that was good in our heritage. The World Cup win gave us a new strength to understand our place in our society as cricketers. In the World Cup, a country found a new beginning, a new inspiration upon which to build their dreams of a better future for Sri Lanka. Here were 15 individuals from different backgrounds, races and religions, each fiercely proud of his own individuality, and yet they united not just as a team, but as a family, fighting for a common national cause, representing the entirety of our society, providing a shining example to every Sri Lankan showing them with obvious clarity what it was to be truly Sri Lankan. The 1996 World Cup gave all Sri Lankans a commonality, one point of collective joy and ambition that gave a divided society true national identity and was to be the panacea that healed all social evils and would stand the country in good stead through terrible natural disasters and a tragic civil war. The 1996 World Cup win inspired people to look at their country differently. The sport overwhelmed terrorism and political strife. It provided something that everyone held dear to their hearts and helped normal people get through their lives. The team also became a microcosm of how Sri Lankan society should be, with players from different backgrounds, ethnicities and religions sharing their common joy, their passion, and love for each other and their motherland. Regardless of war, here we were playing together, and the Sri Lankan team became a harmonizing factor. After the historic win, the entire game of cricket in Sri Lanka was revolutionized. Television money started to pour into cricket board's coffers. Large national and multinational corporations fought for sponsorship rights. Cricketers started to earn real money, both in the form of national contracts and endorsement deals. For the first time, cricketers won billboards and television advertising products, advertising anything from sausages to cellular networks. Cricket became a viable profession, and cricketers were both icons and role models. Personally, the win was very important for me. Until that time, I was playing cricket with no real passion or ambition. I never thought or dreamed of playing for my country. This changed when I watched Sri Lanka play Kenya at Asgiria. It was my final year in school, and the first seed of my vision to play for my country was planted in my brain and heart. When I witnessed Sanat Gurusinghe and Aravinda produce a devastating display of batting. That seed of ambition spurted into life when a couple of weeks later I watched that glorious final in Lahore. Everyone in Sri Lanka remembers where they were on the night of that final. The cheering of a nation was a sound no bomb or exploding shell could drown. 
cricket became an integral and all important aspect of our national psyche. Our cricket embodied everything in our lives. Our laughter and tears, our hospitality, our generosity, our music, our food and drink. It was normalcy and hope and inspiration in a war-ravaged land. In it was our culture and heritage, enriched by a myriad ethnicities and religions. In it we were untouched, at least for a while, by petty politics and divisions. It is indeed a pity that life is not cricket. If it were, we would not have seen the festering wounds of an ignorant war. The emergence of cricket and the new role of cricket within Sri Lankan society also meant that the cricketers had bigger responsibilities than merely playing on the field. We needed to live positive lifestyles off the field and we needed to give back. The same people that applaud us every game need us to contribute positively back to their lives. We needed to inspire mostly now off the field. The tsunami was one such event. The death and destruction left in its wake was a blow our country could not afford. We were in New Zealand playing our first ODI. We had played badly, like at the Oval, and were sitting disappointed in the dressing room when, as usual, Sanat's phone started beeping. He read the SMS and told us a strange thing had just happened back home where waves from the sea had flooded some areas. Initially, we weren't too worried, thinking it was a freak tide. It was only when we were back in the hotel watching the news coverage that we realized the magnitude of the devastation. It was horrifying to watch footage of the waves sweeping through coastal towns and washing away in the blink of an eye the lives of thousands. We could not believe that it had happened. We called home to check. Is it true, we asked? How can the pictures be real, we thought. All we wanted to do was go back home to be with our families and stand together with our people. I remember landing in the airport on 31st December, a night when the whole of Colombo is normally lit up for festivities, a time of music and laughter and revelry. But the town was empty and dark, the mood depressed and silent with sorrow. While we were thinking how we could help, Murli was quick to provide the inspiration. Murli is a guy who has been pulled from all sides during his career, but he's always stood only alongside his teammates and countrymen. Without any hesitation, he was on the phone to his contacts, both local and foreign, and in a matter of days, along with the World Food Program, he had organized container loads of basic necessities of food, water, and clothing to be distributed to the affected areas and people. Amazingly, refusing to delegate the responsibility of distribution to the concerned authorities, he took it upon himself to accompany the convoys. It was my good fortune to be invited to join him. My wife and I, along with Mahela, Ruchira Pereira, our physio CJ Clark, and many other volunteers drove alongside the aid convoys towards an experience that changed me as a person. We based ourselves in Polo Naro, just north of Dambulla, driving daily to visit tsunami-ravaged coastal towns like Trincomalee and Batiklo, as well as southern towns like Gaul and Hambantota on later visits. We visited shelter camps run by the Army and the LTTE, and even some administered in partnership between them to bitter warring factions brought together to help people in a time of need. In each camp, we saw the effects of the tragedy written upon the faces of the young and old. Vacant and empty eyes filled with sorrow and longing for homes, for loved ones, and for livelihoods lost to the terrible waves. Yet for us, their cricketers, they managed a smile. In the Kinya camp, just south of Trincomalee, the first response of the people who had lost so much <clears throat> was to ask us if our families were okay. <clears throat> they had heard that Sanat and Upul Chandana's mothers were injured and they inquired about their health. They did not exaggerate their own plight, nor did they wallow in it. 
their concern was equal for all those around them. This was true in all the camps we visited. Through their devastation shone the Sri Lankan spirit of indomitable resilience, compassion, generosity, and hospitality, and gentleness. This is the same spirit in which we play our cricket. In this, our darkest hour, a country stood together in support and love for each other, united and strong. I experienced all this and vowed to myself that never would I be tempted to abuse the privilege that these very people had afforded me. The honor and responsibility of representing them on the field, playing a game they loved and adored. The role the cricketers played in their personal capacities for post-tsunami relief and rebuilding was worthy of the trust the people of a nation had in them. Murali again stands out. His Sinigama project with his manager Kushil Gunasekara, which I know the MCC has supported and still does with an ongoing funding of over 30,000 pounds a year, and which included the rebuilding of over 1,000 homes, was amazing. I was fortunate that during my life, I never experienced violence in Sri Lanka firsthand. There had been so many bomb explosions over the years, but I was never in the wrong place at the wrong time. In Colombo, apart from these occasional bombs, life was relatively normal. People had the luxury of being physically detached from the war. Children went to school, people went to work, and I played my cricket. In other parts of the country, though, people were putting their lives in harm's way every day, either in the defense of their motherland or just trying to survive the geographical circumstances that made them inhabit a war zone. For them, avoiding bullets, shells, mines, and grenades was imperative for survival. This was an experience I could not relate to. I had great sympathy and compassion for them, but I had no real experience from which I could draw parallels. That was until we toured Pakistan in 2009. 